going out into the beautiful Willapa Bay. It's captained by Ken Weigert. Ken, how long has your family been uh, farming oysters? Well, I'm fifth generation. Uh, we've lived on and worked the Willapa since 1874. What's the biggest pest problem uh, in growing oysters? By far, burrowing shrimp. And what, what's a burrowing shrimp? It's not actually a shrimp at all. It's a crustacean that burrows down into the substrate and it creates a network of tunnels and burrows. But by doing that, it undermines the stability of the substrate. If you, if you just look around, it's, it turns it almost into uh, quicksand. And why is that a problem for growing oysters? Well, it's not just for growing oysters, it's for growing anything or, in fact, anything that lives on top of the, uh, the mud. Um, it'll either sink or through their burrowing action because the, the mud that they displace comes up through the tops of the burrows. Anything will either sink or get buried. I notice you're sinking right now. Is that mm -hmm. because of burrowing shrimp? Yes, it is. So what happens if you uh, um, put oysters on here? I put oysters on this ground. Um, you wouldn't be able to find a single one within a week. They would all be gone. They'd all sink or, or get buried. So that's why there's no oysters here? Yep. And that's why there's nothing here? That's why there is nothing here. Because of burrowing shrimp. Yep. Is, is burrowing shrimp native? Has it always been here? Burrowing shrimp is native. Um, however, for some reason, the, in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s, they started exploding outside of their, their natural habitats in the bay. Um, a lot of people think that this is because of the damming of the Columbia. Willapop Bay used to get annual freshets, freshwater freshets, and that would kind of naturally control the burrowing shrimps and keep them, keep them isolated in, in pockets here and there. But uh, without those freshets, the population has just exploded. Can you tell, what is that word you're using, freshets? Freshets. I've never heard of that word. What does that mean? Uh, fresh, it's fresh water, so uh, every spring when the, when the snowpack melts and when you get up a lot in the, of... Up in the mountains, yeah. comes down the Columbia River, yeah, exactly. which is just, just south of us. Just south. And when it comes out the river, it goes it out right. and circles in and comes into uh, Willapa uh, Bay. Ten uh, burrows per meter square, uh, and each of these whole t counts as a burrow. So there's probably about 150, maybe 200 per meter square here well above the economic threshold for treating. Uh, so it doesn't take many burrowing shrimp to have uh, economic damage. These are small sh these are small shrimp. They're about, well that one's probably th three years old. These are about four or five years old. Uh, they'll live to about 12 to 15 years. Get about the size of a crawfish. Um, and they're about, oh, down to a meter below the surface. That what makes them a real challenge to to control. The males have the bigger claws. There's a female here. Usually they're trying to find one that's gravid or has eggs in it, but I don't see anyone yet. But Kim, can you give us a short history of the control of burrowing shrimp? Uh, okay, short history. Back in the late 50s and 60s, Department of uh, Wildlife. Fish and Wildlife did a lot of work on control and came up with a product called Carbaryl or Seven, and that was uh, used for uh, until about 2014 was the last time it was applied. Uh, and it, they did a lot of work showing, you know, the impacts on the the ecosystem, on on crab, on everything, and basically found that if you take an area like this, you treat it with Carboil, the shrimp go away, eelgrass comes in, you get a, uh, you can put on the shell, you get a three-dimensional habitat that uh, becomes quite functional as an ecosystem habitat compared to this, which is sort of an ecological desert because the only thing here is, is, is shrimp and there's no eelgrass and so forth. So that, so that was the control that was used, then it became very controversial and a lot of lawsuits over the last probably 40 years. Eventually it was phased out in an agreement in 23 or something, 10 year agreement to come up with something new, which then uh, WSU researchers uh, just found that, you know, imminent cloprid was pretty decent uh, chemistry that, and we got, uh, did all the, the, the habitat work on that and 
the fate and persistence showed that yeah it works pretty well it has minimum impact at rates uh, a lot less than carbaryl and it was a good substitute we got a register at the EPA thanks to help with the pesticide commission um, and well, they're ready to use. We got it registered, ready to go. All the permits, NPDES, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and then the it uh, was just sort of uh, probably a, a couple years too late in the use of a neonicotinoid in the re registration because it was basically the front page of the Seattle Times was the shellfish industry uses nerve toxin. And, uh, and the industry withdrew their permit and stopped using anything, or didn't ever use anything. And we haven't had a control since 2014, I think, it was the last time we sprayed anything. Can, can, can you give me a ballpark estimate of what, and I'm, I'm sinking, I gotta uh, get out. Um, can you tell me, you know, approximate or estimate what the economic cost of not being able to control burning shrimp has been to your company? For my farm alone, um, we've lost about 30,000 bushel carrying capacity on our fattening beds. That is, those are, that's ground that we move oysters to. It's kind of similar to a feedlot for cattle because there's a lot of food on that ground. It gets them nice and fat and, and ready for market. Can you but, translate? I, I think it's, it's hard for people like me to understand what a, a bushel of oysters is worth. What's the... What's the cost to you in finished product uh, of 30,000 bushels of oysters? Close to $400,000. So 400000 to your, your company, and that's just your company. Um, do you have a, I mean, do you have an estimate like what the annual cost of the industry uh, from lack of control? I mean, if it's 400000 for you, I'm, it's, it's in the millions. Yeah, I'm a medium-sized company. And there's companies that are a lot small, uh, smaller companies that are a lot bigger. So if I'm at almost half a million dollars, it's it's multi. So it's millions you know, and millions and millions, millions, millions of dollars. And the other thing, aside from the uh, aside from the economic consequences of this, uh, there's a tremendous environmental cost. I'm just looking over here, and this 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 looks like a like the, a tidal flat desert. Mm -hmm ground we're standing on, I mean, above and beyond shellfish culture, this this is prime marina habitat, native eelgrass habitat. But the eelgrass, it can't root in, it can't stabilize itself, so there's none here. And so the, and the, the community that lives on the native eelgrass is not here, so yeah. this impacts Dungeness crab, uh, manila clams. It impacts the entire food chain. The entire food chain. I mean, the whole food web in this bay is based from the start on just small benthic diatoms and, and phytoplankton and when you have just this bare sand that's constantly getting churned, that food web has no chance to get started. I started working with you in 1995 uh, looking for alternatives out of that research project. We came up with imidacloprid uh, in 1997. Um, you looked for alternatives. You look for synthetic chemicals, conventional chemicals, non-chemical means, something other than carbaryl. All right, can you really quickly as you can run through all the things that have been tried? Uh, we've probably screened about 60 different total chemistries starting, you start with the stuff that is sort of generally recognized as safe and you go through those things that'd be like the uh, pepper and uh, Various, clove, oil, clove, clove oil and some of the oil, cinnamon oil, clove oil, garlic oil, uh, habanero pepper, uh, as for an example. Um, then you start going to the the sort of the the light chemistries that uh, maybe you're hoping they might work. But they're really not effective. Um, gosh, I can't even think of some of the names, but uh, stuff that you can actually probably potentially register. Uh, and then you start going into some of the more obscure, newer chemistries that the companies are, are saying, no, we're not interested in them. But you screen all that stuff. And no, I cannot remember all of them. Uh, but most of them are just sort of the generally recognized as safe stuff. But and you looked at, you know, I was doing part of yeah. that work with you, and uh, it was over 60 different active ingredients, right. synthetic, natural, organic, anything yeah. we thought had efficacy against burrowing shrimp, 
and would potentially have minimal environmental impact. And we right. went through the whole pharmacopoeia. Yeah. Now, you also tried non-chemical controls. Right. What, what did you... Well, uh, we looked at uh, a lot of mechanical methods such as compaction, uh, rotivation. Uh, um, we looked at injecting gas and exploding the sediment uh, like they use for go gopher control. We looked at um, pumping them out. I looked at uh, things along those lines, harrowing them, disking them. Uh, there's nothing that works, not even close. You know, it, the what has to count as the oddest proposal that ever came to the Commission on Pesticide Registration was someone wanting to do research uh, using cetaceans or wells for biocontrol of burrowing shrimp. Yeah. Well, and also, they were wondering about using sturgeon. Yeah. Well, we did. We did. We did look at a lot of biocontrol. And actually, if you, we'll probably see some feeding pits or, right here. This is a good one. Oh. This is actually a green sturgeon uh, feeding pit where the large adult uh, sturgeon will come in here with their big uh, proboscis mouth, and they will suck out shrimp like this one here, and and feed through this this whole area. It and doesn't. You, it doesn't seem like it's doing much good. Uh, it's it's probably good for the sturgeon, but it doesn't. They you would need a lot more sturgeon than we than there probably are in the world, probably just to affect this one little area here. It's also an enlisted species, which means you're not going to do anything with it as far as research or anything like that. Um, and they, they, there have been a lot of projects now since then that have shown that the the shrimp are not a limiting factor for its success because they want to know well if, if there's a limiting factor then you're not allowed to even control shrimp. They've at least shown that. Um, but uh, crab and other things, uh, look at some of the polychaetes and other things, the predatory ones, uh, large lugworms and other things, that, but nothing works on these things. I, uh, and what has to also be one of the most interesting and, and bizarre aspects of what normally would be an agricultural research program, uh, one of your research reports to the Commission on Pesticide talked about in your field plots out here of having you had you were taking pictures oh, underwater yeah. of your research plots oh, yeah. to see what was going on, yeah. and there were there were big sharks. Big sharks, there. seven gilded sharks that will come in here and. Uh, that we were not expecting to find on our plots and it was like oh, okay maybe we don't want to get in that water i mean we also did a lot of tarping and a lot of uh, we even thin layers of cement quick drying cement that we'd lay over here a uh, netting uh, mesh um, fiber um, all sorts of things mechanically to try to suppress them and keep oysters from sinking and uh, it's they're going to sink so the, the the two products have been shown to work Carbaryl and, and imidacloprid, yeah. and now uh, you're off looking at some. We're brand looking new at new things. Uh, there, uh, we have a little window to try to get some, a, a, evaluate a list of approved chemistries. Basically, we're I'm assessing stuff I've already assessed. Maybe in you know, a wing and a prayer, maybe something happened between now and then, and they're more susceptible. There's some a few new chemistries that that have come online, and some old stuff that. But we've got some approval from Department of Ag and Department of Ecology say you can look at these chemistries, and they're and we're just doing it in the lab because we don't have permission to work in the in the, in the bay yet uh, to assess uh, efficacy and non-target impacts to uh, uh, juvenile Dungeness crab. From there, we can go to more field trials. And, and Kim, at, yeah. Kim, what is the what is the aggregate economic impact of burning shrimp on the shellfish industry? Oh, in aggregate. Oh, probably in the. 20 million dollar a year range because it affects gooey ducks and, and other things in that, in that ballpark. How important is water quality to oyster growers? Water quality is one of the most important things for us. Um, if we don't have clean water, we don't have clean oysters. Oysters filter the water and they eat what's in the water, so anything that's in the water will also be in the oysters. So. You have polluted or water that's not clean, you don't have safe oysters. So, when you were applying carbaryl or planning to apply imidacloprid, how do you not have that product in the oysters? Well, when we were applying carbaryl, we couldn't harvest oysters for one year after treatment. And that was done to ensure that there was absolutely 
nothing, nothing left in the oysters. They did a lot of studies on the amended cloakard and they found that after 24 hours it was non-detectable. So there wasn't that one year, uh, one year uh, of no harvest.